Good day. This is a wonderful day at Women's Television. And my name is Gloria Nixon Pone. And I am especially excited today because we have the lovely, the talented, the outstanding, the doctor, lawyer, <laughs> India. Uh, she is everything. And I have been trying to get her on Women's TV for quite a while. So please welcome. Gloria Brown Marshall. Gloria, I am happy that you're here. Thank you to have two Glorias in one place. What a blessing. Yes, <laughs> that is a blessing. Now, we met a while ago at Hofstra University, and it was a great event where you gave, gave an outstanding oration and where you invited the audience, and you told us things that we had no idea that uh, even existed. You, your information, your knowledge on constitutional law. Uh, but I'm just wondering why, why do we need to care about constitutional law? But I want you to answer that question after you tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, I am an associate professor at John Jay College and associate professor of constitutional law. So I also teach in the gender studies program. So I teach about gender, gender. and justice. I teach race in the law. As a matter of fact, I have a book, a very well, I, I would say, a well-written book people should get. <laughs> and, and the title of it is Race, Law, and American Society, 1607 to Present. And um, it, it has the legal cases, but it's written in a very accessible, readable way so that people can understand so many years, 1607 to present, people mm. have worked in education, in criminal justice, as well as voting rights, property rights. They've worked around civil liberties, the military, internationalism. All these areas of American life have involved legal cases. Mm. And so what I do is I, I present the reader with the legal cases to show, even though it's two steps forward and one step back, without those essential two steps, we wouldn't be here today in wow. order for us to sit here and enjoy the freedoms that we have. And that's why the Constitution is so important. Because although I have a nonprofit organization, the Law and Policy Group, mm -hmm. and we publish the report on the status of black women and girls every wow. other year. Wow. Uh, but all of this that we have as women, mm -hmm. as people of color and children, because the Law and Policy Group bridges the gap between laws, policies, and the people who govern them. And we focus on the issues of women, children, and people of color. But if we don't have law, then what are the rights of those people? How do we challenge anything if there's no law to challenge, to say we're not getting everything we're supposed to have? How do you know what you're supposed to have? Yes. The Constitution provides that. And so if we don't know what's in the Constitution, we don't even know what we're missing. Mm. So is um, real law sort of like television law, like <laughs> Judge Judy? Or this morning I was watching one of the young lawyers who happened to be an African-American woman who was dealing with divorce cases. So is real law, is the law like what we see on TV? Well, let's put it this way. In order to make it interesting, you have to have a protagonist, you have to have a conflict, you have to solve the conflict, and you have to pay the bills with commercials. <laughs> <laughs> and so TV law allows you to do all that <laughs> within 30 minutes or an hour. You know, but real law takes a lot longer than that, and it's not as exciting and interesting. So if you look at little aspects of TV law, and think, yeah, there's a judge, yes, there's a jury, and we should all make sure that we answer our jury summons mm. because in order for our system to work, we yes. need to be participants. <laughs> and the American legal system is based on people participating. For example, and one of the things I did was to take the U.S. Constitution, mm -hmm. and I developed this, and it's the U.S. Constitution in African-American context uh -huh. because there are more references to people of color, especially of African descent, in the U.S. Constitution than to any other group group and it's actually laminated and available on Amazon but wow. the reason why I'm saying okay. this is because within the Constitution if you look at um, the right to confront witnesses mm. in the in the Bill of Rights we have the right to have the witness there in the courtroom that's why you have the Department of Corrections make sure that they'll have the prisoner come or whoever the detainee is into the courtroom we also have the right to a jury trial. We mm. have a right to an impartial jury. All of that is within the Constitution. Mm. So we also have a right to an open proceeding, which means anybody during the time the court is open can walk into that courtroom, sit down, and watch the proceeding. 
Wow. This is what keeps our system honest because the judge, the attorneys, no one knows what person is going to walk in that courtroom and sit down. Whether or not you stay five minutes or five hours, you have the right to any access to court, open court, to see if the system is, is, is actually running correctly and fairly. And only certain state secrets, for example, NSA mm. <laughs> <laughs> and um, family court are the only times when they don't allow people to just walk into federal, state, even the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm. Well, that is exciting. I, I, I feel your passion. I, I see this I'm is you. That's all it is. I'm I see a this is drink. you. So earlier, I asked you. I said, Gloria. Now, are you a journal? Are you a journalist or are you a lawyer? And your answer was, I am a journalist who writes about law. So I cover the U.S. Supreme Court. So I travel to Washington, D.C., I sit in in the press room, and, and I'm there within the court to watch the oral arguments. And the U.S. Supreme Court has oral arguments from October, when the session starts, the first Monday in October, until April. And then decisions come out during that entire time, and the last decision comes about the end of June. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the big case, like the defense of marriage case for, for marriage equality, uh -huh. that case came out the, this past um, June. Um, the Shelby County case, dealing with voting wow. rights, that case now, came out. Now, is that Shelby County, Tennessee? Shelby County, Alabama. Alabama, yes. Yeah, Shelby yes, County versus Holder. So yes. there are major cases going on right now, and the, the, the um, opinions of the court can come out at any time, but the big cases, usually the decisions are at the end of the session, which is the, in June, the end of June. Mm -hmm. I... Uh, I am just so amazed and impressed. Now, I'm just wondering, this seems like law. I have lawyers in my family, and some of them are men, but more recently my niece has become a lawyer. And uh, I'm just wondering, what is it like being a lawyer, a female, and being in that uh, bullpen, if you will? Well, I'm going to tell you, in the very beginning, I won't give away any years, but in the, very, <laughs> in the beginning, in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was very restrictive mm. how we carried ourselves. I was a law clerk. I was a law clerk for a state court judge. I was a law clerk for a federal court judge. And I worked in civil rights. So mm. I worked in major civil rights organizations. And what I found was there were double standards then, but the double mm. standards were clear. Mm. Women did and did not do this. For example, you couldn't wear a color. You a could color? Only, you could not wear a color. That red I was maybe the first female attorney to actually wear a red suit. Oh, my goodness. That <laughs> meant funny. you weren't serious like about your occupation. That is funny. And then all the suits had these box shoulders, and, you know, they were all black. And one time a friend of mine said, was in, you know, in my house and, you know, looked in my closet and said, you know, your suits are black. I said, what about the gray one there? You know, I, said, <laughs> I kept the gray one for special occasions. But I'll tell you this. I wasn't one of those people who knew when I was a baby I wanted to be a lawyer. Basically, when I was in college, I changed my major many, many times. Mm. I had different interests because I knew I wanted to be a writer. Mm. I knew I wanted to be an advocate. Mm. And I wanted to have a business. So I took all the tests for graduate school, for MBA, for uh -huh. law, for, for GRE, for, for graduate school and, and writing. And at the end of the day, I ended up, you know, stressfully going through life in this journey that has me writing books, mm. being an advocate, wow. and having a nonprofit organization as a business. Wow. So for young people out there, it's like it may look like in the beginning, it's all over the place, but I still see how little by little you can actually have what you want, but as the former um, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor said, women can have all they want, they just can't have it all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is awesome. Well, what is it like becoming a lawyer? Would you, is there a certain, like, uh, could I go for it now, yes. even at my age? That's the great thing about law. I have a, a very good female friend of mine who is a dancer, but mm -hmm. I met her when she was in college, and she was my intern. And she said, I'm interning with you at a law firm, a nonprofit law firm, because I want to be a lawyer. And I said, okay, you could be a lawyer at any time in your life. You can only be a dancer in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I see. So I suggest you dance now and lawyer later. <laughs> <laughs> I know she appreciated that. Well, you know, and the good news is about law, 
the law looks for diversity. Mm. So look at it this way. There's a class of 200 seats, and the admissions committee looks at how do we have the most diverse class? How do we have the best admittees? How do we have people we know who will go through the three-year program because it's three years? How do we do all that? So you have geographical um, diversity. We don't want everybody from New York City. Mm -hmm. What about that person from Texas, mm -hmm. Hawaii, South Dakota? Mm. You know, we want to have women, but we don't want to have all young women. Maybe we want some other, other women with more experience. We want people who might have worked and other people straight out of college. Mm. So depending on the law school class, you're going to have a lot of diversity. Wow. I, well, I think diversity is good. I, I love diversity. That's why I love New York City. Ah. You know, I think it's, it's, it's remarkable. And I love teaching at John Jay College. And so as an associate professor at John Jay College, teaching constitutional law, I get to actually teach our Constitution uh -huh. to people who might have come from countries mm. where there was no Constitution or wow. that Constitution was not respected. Also, you have other countries that don't have a jury system. You have other wow. countries that have different forms of application of law. Or maybe they come from a country that run by a despot, mm. and that's why their parents brought them here in the first place. So to wow. them, what is law? The law is what rich people have. It doesn't apply to the regular person. So my challenge then is to take the Constitution and make it interesting for those young people, for them to understand why this is the longest lasting Constitution on the planet. Wow. And it's only been amended a handful of times for the most part. And here we have it still being applied, started in 1787 and being applied in 2014. So it's not the wording, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, the U.S. Supreme Court said that we could segregate the country. 1954, the same words in the Constitution are interpreted to dismantle segregation in public schools in Brown versus Board of Education. Wow. So we need to pay attention to those nine members of the U.S. Supreme Court because they are interpreting the words that were written in 1787 and of course the Bill of Rights in 1791, the words have stayed the same. It's the interpretation that changes with time. Mm. That's, that's saying that as people live and understand differently, they speak differently and they interpret differently. Yes, and, but um, just, Justice Scalia believes just the opposite because the, the living Constitution is one that applies and grows with us as we grow as a nation. Mm. But you have some um, people like, you know, Justice Scalia, Antonin Scalia, who's conservative, who believes he calls himself a, uh, calls himself a textualist. He says the words, like some fundamentalists who believe in the Quran and the Bible to mean exactly what the words say, right. that's what he thinks the Constitution should be, exactly mm. what it was meant to be in 1787. Wow. So you have those people and you have extreme liberals all on the same U.S. Supreme Court. And that's why we have such interesting decisions. <laughs> that way. Well, I, I see lawyer. I see um, that you're a journalist. Uh, and I know that you love to write because you just told me. What is some of the kinds of writing you like to do most? Well, I have a new play. Excuse me? Yeah, so I'm a playwright, and I have I have seven <laughs> produced plays. Wow! And I love writing in different venues and fora because it depends. I write a weekly column, mm -hmm. so my, my articles are in the Dallas Weekly, the Black Star News here in Brooklyn, New York, the wow. Black Star News. I heard that you were syndicated. Yes, and as well as Milwaukee Courier mm -hmm. and, you know, several other Chicago, papers. Chicago. And Chicago, yes. yes. And, so and St. Louis, Missouri. The St. Louis American. Sunny St. Louis. Yes. <laughs> and so what I like to do is say, for example, Maybe there's something about the Constitution or race and the law, some case that I think, you know, I really want people to understand more. Should I be an essay? Should it be an article in the newspaper? Or maybe it should be a play. Mm. Should it be within a book? I don't know. It might be a speech, for example, or part of a presentation, like the, the Hofstra, where we met. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm not sure, but I try to figure out what's the best way to get the message across. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel very blessed that I, I can write in different ways. And so my new play, the title of it is Class. 
Mm. And it's going to be directed by a director at William & Mary in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so that's going to be in March. And so I'm hoping that, it'll you know, it'll come to New York. Yes. And it'll be on Broadway and win Tony Awards. And wow. it'll be an excellent thing because I think it's a learning experience because the play class is two-character play. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the commercial, quick commercial. A working-class Irish-American confronts his snobbish African-American professor mm. about a grade change that could get him in a prestigious college. Now, so his, his professor happened to be a female I think yes. <laughs> But uh, I feel this. I feel something coming now. I know. You got the, your boxing gloves on. And, it, and this is really because between the two of them, they take this journey through American history, mm -hmm. through race relations, and through class. Mm -hmm. Because we rarely discuss class in this country. But the class and race have been intermingled since the time of 1619 when African Americans or Africans came to the Jamestown colony. And we don't talk about those things. And so this play actually explores race and class. Wow, that is absolutely interesting. So maybe we'll have to just come, uh, if it doesn't come to New York soon, we'll have to hop a boat or a plane <laughs> or a train so we can, we can see this. I'm, it, it's, I believe that multitasking, tasking, which se you seem to do pretty doggone well, well is is necessary but i have a friend who said that women are like spaghetti if you move if you move one strand of the spaghetti the whole bowl moves but men are like waffles you pour the, the syrup in one waffle at a time and you go but women just have a way of doing this now does your fem feminicity or does your gender uh help you to elevate yourself and get all of these things done or d is it a setback? I'll tell you, the great thing about being able to do all the things that I do because I'm a woman and no one is paying attention. Mmm. Mmm. I better write that down. <laughs> <laughs> so I have used the fact that people are not paying attention. They're not taking it seriously. They're like, oh, okay, well, you go over and play over here. And it's like, <laughs> all right, then I will play, you know. But I feel that it's an investment in me. So sometimes even if people don't get what it is you're doing, I mean, I think especially within the black community, we have 51, 52 percent of the community mm. ready, willing, and able to contribute to the betterment of our community and very often our ideas are ignored or it, we don't actually um, we don't look at ourselves as serious and many other people don't look at us as seriously mm -hmm. mm -hmm. coming to us and saying Gloria what do you think the community should do in this particular situation as opposed to we're always saying pick me pick me I have an idea you know and we're running around trying to put our ideas together and we give them away Mm. You, do you know in the last presidential election, black women voted in the highest percentage of any group mm. in the country? Black women. Wow. And this has been consistent since we've had the, the right to vote and have been able to, through the Voting Rights Act in 1965, to push through to use that right to vote. Mm -hmm. we, we vote in high percentages, yet we're like cheap dates. Mm. So mm. I say don't be a cheap date. Mm. Because my concern is we spend so much time trying to get people to notice our ideas. Please take our ideas mm -hmm. that we're not being compensated well for them. Yes. We're not being compensated for our hard work and our contributions. And not only do we have to say, yes, I have a great idea, and it's valuable enough for you to pay attention. And when you need great ideas, you should know where you can find one. Mm. Because my track record has shown that I'm able to give great ideas. But so many women, I think, get stressed out because we're not taken seriously. Mm. And we're doing serious things, whether or not it's taking care of the children or getting PhDs mm. or fighting in the courtrooms for people's rights, educating other people. Yes. All of these things we're doing are serious things, and we're educating ourselves, we're preparing ourselves. But there are too few times when people come to us and say, I want to know what you think. Mm. And sometimes... Men mm. may believe, I don't want to open that box. Oh, she's going to start talking. It won't stop and everything. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking? We were there, especially the African-American experience. Uh -huh. We all came in together. 
We were chained together. Mm. We took the lash together. We ran away together. Harriet Tubman brought up man, woman, and child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. for people to turn around now and say, I'm up here and you're down there, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. When no <laughs> other groups began in this country together, Yes, the way we did. Absolutely. So now how can people turn around and say, I have to be up here and you have to be down there in order for my ego to be satisfied? Yes, yes, yes. It's like we, we you know, so I, I look at this and say, women need to take other women seriously. Yes. Men need to take uh, women seriously. Yes. But men and women need to have more dialogues about what the community needs and how each one of us has something to contribute to make it better. Yes. Well. A couple of days ago, I had an opportunity to just be uh, surfing, and I came across Maya Angelou, and she said, "You, uh, one person can be rich, and one person can be poor. One person can speak well, and perhaps another can't. She says, but there is one thing that no individual has more or less of than any other individual, and that's humanity. We all are equal in terms of our humanity and being human. So I, I applaud her for that. But I, I, I'm thinking also about the things that you're saying about gender. And I, I'm a person who believes this is women's television, women's TV. And uh, recently I came across in the S Civil Rights Code 7702, and it talks about women and clergy and the fact that they don't have the same rights. And I, I'm wondering, is that anything that other women in law are talking about, or is it pretty much uh, let the church roll on? Well, it's interesting because within constitutional law, the Supreme Court has interpreted it to be the church, of course, you have gender bias, which is against the law, but you have church rules or doctrine that might include gender bias. And the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted the law to say, we're going to allow the church to make its own decisions. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to discrimination, the church can discriminate to a certain degree based on church doctrine. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, this whole idea of church and state is a very touchy issue. And you know that the First Amendment um, precludes the government from establishing an, a religion, which means the government is not supposed to dictate one way or the other mm -hmm. what the church or any um, religious entity is supposed to do. So within the church, there has to be the struggle to make change. And that's what's taking place around um, sexual orientation, for example, mm -hmm. as well as with, with gender, this idea that people within the church are agitating for change. Mm. So I think there has to be something that takes place within the body of any religious entity to cause change to take place. But outside agitation at the same time has also always allowed change, whether or not that changes for gender, for race, for dis disability, age, whatever it might be, uh -huh. agitate, agitate, agitate. Agitate, agitate, agitate. <laughs> I mean, I just, there, but there are that different sounds like forms. like AAA. Agitate, <laughs> agitate, agitate. But there are different forms of agitation. I mean, there are, there are forms of agitation, whether or not it's a petition that a person signs on a street corner or it's the, the way a, a person votes. If it could be a protest sign, it could be whatever it may be, but there are ways in which we can make change to make the society better. But first and foremost, what is the vision of the future? How do you see women's roles in the future? And then let's create what we need to do to get to that, that future image. But if we don't have an image, as they say in the Bible, you know, without vision, the people perish. Yes, I've heard that. I've read that many times. I, I'm, I'm excited because... You know, it seems to be your message. Maybe we have to get you in the pulpit, darling. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that your message is one of hope. It and is. I, I think that sometimes I talk to young women and they don't seem to have much hope. Be without vision. One thing that we can do as older women or women with experience is to let them know that we had a vision. And that's why I like that song, I had a vision of love. Mm. You know, what is the vision we have for them? How can we inculcate them with that vision so they have something to strive for? 
because a lot of us is not it just feels like we're in this little race by ourselves and there's no reason for us to think 20 years 50 years 100 years i think what would great grandchildren want to be if the women what would a female great grandchild do mm. how should her life be envisioned Yes. And yes, so yes. without that vision, then we, we're really falling back on just rehashing the same thing we already know. Yes, that is absolutely true. You know, my grandmother was the woman in the community who delivered uh, our babies. So she was out there doing it. And her, my mother direct, my, my mother learned so much from her about uh, education and about earning income. She was an entrepreneur. And when she saw the conditions of our schools in West Memphis, Arkansas, she decided that she was going to do something that had never been heard of before. She was going to send her two daughters off to a private school. So she raised the money, sent us off to school, and people were saying, oh, that's crazy. Oh, you don't need to do that. But she, but she would not be stopped because she understood what was going on. And I'm so glad you said that because sometimes people will not understand. And even if people do not understand, that's why I said being a woman has given me a great deal of freedom because a lot of times people are not paying attention. They don't understand what I'm doing and they can't support or seem scary even though they're not putting any money toward it. They mm -hmm, can't even mm -hmm. give support. Then you have to really support yourself and make sure that you understand that there is a future vision and that you're making an investment, not mm -hmm. just in yourself, but mm -hmm. that's primary mm -hmm. to make an investment in yourself, but you're also making an investment in the community and, and other, other well, women. Well, I, I'm so glad. I mean, being re born and raised in Arkansas taught me a lot of things. Well, that it was how because, to stay out of the sun. Yes. <laughs> I'm sad and uh, I, I learned so much, and I, civil rights was a big part of our Daisy lives Bates. and the way we lived, and the, our schools were not separate nor equal, but they were disasters. And I, I, I'm so pleased to know that we've made some progress, but now I see that we have so far to go. What's the vision? What is the vision? The what vision is, the is vision? that, right, right. And so my grandmother had that vision for me, and my mother had the vision, and my sister, for, for us, the girls, she, she was concerned about the boys, but not so much because she didn't want us to have to work in the kitchens of white people when she knew that we were capable. Of but doing so much more. Yes, of doing yes. so much more, but guess what, Gloria? Gloria and Gloria, I have to tell you, we've come to the end of our little chit-chat, girl. <laughs> and uh, do you have any parting words, just uh, 30 seconds or so, just... The wealthiest person in the world and the poorest person in the world all have the same thing. 24 hours in the day, what are you doing with your time? Hmm, that's great. See lie, as they would say in the church. Pause and think on that. I would like to say to everyone, Women's TV is here. It's a few good women doing great things. And it's, it's, it's an opportunity to hear the stories of our sisters, such as the esteemed <laughs> Gloria Brown Marshall, who is an author, a, a, a writer, a journalist. And she was there when President Obama received his uh, award. In Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel Peace Prize, and she was right there. So I'm happy that, that she's on the program, and all of her information will also be shown on PwnInspirations.com and Women's TV. So we got your back, girl. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I love your smile and your ability to get things done. Thank you. Thank you.